The current administration is having a harder and harder time putting lipstick on a pig, so to speak. We haven't had a full-time job created in the United States since last January, so it's been a year. Everything that's been created has been part-time, and we are a 68% of GDP consumption nation. So if you ask me how the economy is doing, I'm going to tell you how the job market is doing. Danielle DiMartino Booth, Chief Strategist at QI Research and also author of the book Fed Up, an insider's take on why the Federal Reserve is bad for America. It is great to see you again, Danielle, and great to welcome you back on the show. Thank you so much for taking the time. I am so happy to be here today. Uh, You always ask the best questions, so I'm looking so forward. You are way too kind. But I got to say, the viewers love you. So every time you come on, you're a hit. And I want to start, Danielle, where we always start. And that is to get your update on the economy, the macro picture for you today. Take all the time you need to set the table, if you will. Um, So, you know, we are at a we're we're, we're at a public relations crossroad, if you will. Um, The Bureau of Labor Statistics and the Department of Labor, they do their their best effort to put all of the greatest data out there that you could ever shake a stick at um, and to make things really, really, really confusing in the first quarter earnings season, the CEOs across America, it was like the C-suite competition, uh, unless you were the employee losing your job. Uh, It it has been a race. It, It has been a competition, cutthroat competition to cut costs. And, you know, Challenger Grain Christmas, which we always think of as being kind of the firm that follows layoffs, they started to give us an inkling of of what what was going on because in December, they had their lowest December of hiring announcements that they'd ever tracked in data back to the beginning of this young century. And then in January, they again had the weakest January of hiring announcements. So you're seeing the demand for labor absolutely collapse. I was in Austin, Texas, talking to a bunch of, of class of 2024 seniors they're talking about their job offers being rescinded. Um, and, and that's that's the job demand side of it. Uh, but as far as layoffs go, you know, we've, I, I don't, I can't remember the last time we saw 103,732 layoff announcements, but that's what CEOs announced in January in one month. And if, if you look at ADP, which nobody ever does, right? It's all about the 325,000 jobs created. But if you look at ADP, which is just paycheck data, you know, they, there were 107,000 jobs created in January that C-suite executives effectively canceled out. So um, it's the the current administration is having a harder and harder time putting lipstick on a pig, so to speak. We haven't had a full time job created in the United States since um, last January. So it's been a year since we've created a single full-time job, net, net, everything that's been created has been part-time. A lot of people are taking gig, you know, people are driving Uber to offset what they're losing in terms of the job gains that a year ago we were so concerned about. Do you, do you remember, Julia, the wage price spiral? We're mm-hmm. all concerned that wages were going to run away. And now people are taking second jobs to um, to supplement their income. So it, it has been a real about face and we are a 68% of GDP consumption nation. So if you ask me how the economy is doing, I'm going to tell you how the job market's doing. Mm-hmm. Let me ask you this, because how do we reconcile um, that part of the equation? Because a lot of the narrative that gets put out there, and I think a lot of it's the focus on the headline is like robust job growth and and all of that. Help me understand that because I feel like we're missing this side of the story or it's not being reflected in the data maybe. Well, what we pay attention to is, I mean, I'll put you to sleep right now if I start talking to you about month after month of downward revisions and nobody cares. Nobody cares about downward revisions, but downward revisions are exactly what they seem to be. And that is negating the initial announcement. And we have seen that whether you're talking about Let's talk about the National Bureau of Economic Research that dates recessions since the Truman administration, uh, Eisenhower administration. In any event, um, they, they, they're they the ones who say the U.S. economy has entered or exited recession. And they look at industrial production, constant downward re- revisions. They look at personal consumption expenditures, retail sales. Goldman Sachs put out a report a few weeks ago that said we had constant downward revisions in 2023. The payroll report, constant downward revisions, but nobody pays attention to that. 
people pay attention to the 325,000 that, that is initially announced that is in large part because the survey response rates are the lowest on record. It's mostly an imputation. It's mostly, let, let me let me not use a big fancy word because I used to work at the Federal Reserve, imputation. It's mostly a, a, a guess on the part of the statisticians at the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And then when they get the real data in hand, they revise it, but they originally report it downward. But nobody pays attention to that. It's not good for the narrative because the consumer is strong. And this is the hottest job market in the history of mankind. Unless you're in a C-suite, in which case you are writing out virtual pink slips left and right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And a, a lot of um, like a wave of layoffs that you pointed out um, north of 103,000. And I, I have another question for you. Um, cause I've had friends who've gotten laid off and they'll get, um, severance. Like I've heard three months, I've had friends who've gotten six months. I know one person who had a 12 month severance, um, in their, in their, in their, um, contract, I suppose. Does it take a little while for it to show up as well? Like there, there must, is there a delay that before it will show up in the, like a jobs number? So I put out a, a, a plea to all of my institutional clients a few days ago and I'm, I, it, in embarrassment, in embarrassment saying if, Anybody has severance data, send it my way. Um, it, it, it wasn't, I, did, I didn't start thinking about the aggregate. To answer your question, yes. Why have we not seen this show up in jobless claims? I mean, if, if you're a Google former employee and getting nine months of severance on what used to be a $250,000 gig, you're not applying for California unemployment benefits that give you, I think, like $14,000 a year. You're just not, you're not bothering to take the time to fill out the form. Um, but what raised this question in my mind, and by the way, there is so far so bad. If anybody has any aggregate severance data, I'd love to see it. We've never looked for the data, Julia, because there's never been a white collar recession to start a labor cycle. We've never shut the economy down and then reopened it paying the lowest paid workers to leave the workforce and therefore you know, Chipotle having to pay them $18 plus great benefits to bring them back into the workforce such that then when layoffs started because free money was everywhere and because Silicon Valley gained more weight than a former you know actress who we don't look at anymore it, it's um now they're firing all the all they're, they're getting rid of all that fat but we've never seen severance plays such a pivotal role and that's what we're seeing today just to put it in scope google when they reported their earnings a few weeks ago said that in the year 2023 calendar year 2023 they had a 2.1 billion dollar severance charge and that in the first quarter they anticipated first quarter that we're currently in ending march 30th that they anticipated 700 million dollars more in severance costs now add that up across the Nikes and half of Wall Street and all these other white white collar type of positions that are being lost. And these are huge dollar amounts. And they're preventing really the true layoff picture from manifesting in the initial jobless claims data. Do you think one way to describe this is a white collar recession? I think I, I think that's fair. Um, you know, we 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 reference uh, in the world of money management high net worth individuals. Um, the second to highest quintile, so the people in the United States who earn between sixty and eighty percent of um, of median incomes, they earn between one hundred and twenty five and two hundred fifty thousand dollars. To put a dollar stamp on it, they've seen their net worth decline since twenty nineteen decline. Why? All of this student loan forgiveness, they don't qualify for. They left city centers when the pandemic hit. So they have this brand new fancy shiny thing called a mortgage and they have homeowner's insurance and their deductible just doubled here in Texas, doubled for no reason, never made a claim on our home. They have an auto payment for the first time. They have insurance that goes with that. They have car repair costs. And again, they don't qualify for student loan forgiveness. They've seen their net worth decline 
since 2019 because they have so many more obligations than they had before. Yeah. Let me ask you this too. So um, markets recently um, hitting new all-time highs. How do you think, what do you make of the markets and what do you think they are pricing in as it relates to like maybe the broader economy? So, um, you know, a lot of bond traders I speak to, uh, they reference Trueflation, T-R-U. I reference it all the time because they gave me the raw data back to January of 2012, and it's got a 97% correlation with headline CPI. So I follow it because it's the real deal. It's at 1.38%. And I think what the stock market is doing is what it has always done. The stock market initially always celebrates news of impending Federal Reserve rate cuts. You look back in the history of mankind and there's always an initial celebration. The thing is though, if the market got the seven rate cuts that it initially celebrated getting, there's a reason Jay Powell keeps saying, no, 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 it's just gonna be three. Because if they deliver seven, then we're deep in the soup in a recession, deep, deep, deep. So. We're buying the rumor, they will sell the news. It's just, this is, I, I, I'm of the opinion that, that forcibly closing an economy and reopening it does not constitute a two month technical recession. So I'm of the view that we're in the 176th month of an expansion that started uh, in June of 2009, a stock market rally that started in March of 2009. And the longer you have a rally persist, the more, the longer the melt up is going to last. And that's exactly what we're seeing. We could easily go from 5,000 to 6,000 on the S&P before anybody stops and takes a breath because there's so much momentum built in. But let's go back for two seconds. I know you've got another question and talk about the white collar nature of a recession. We're already seeing baby boomers for years now taking distributions from their retirement accounts. It's white collar workers who contribute the most to 401ks and their companies match them. And it's, we're actually starting to see net redemptions from retirement plans, from target date 401k plans. That's the biggest news that, I mean, if, if you can, everybody can turn off the interview right now, just, just walk away and say, the market is 53% passive and we're starting to see net redemptions from retirement funds that key off of passive investing and drive the momentum in the magnificent six because Tesla's losing money. So, um, but, but they drive the momentum in the stocks that make the market go up. So noodle on that. Yeah. And then also, I wonder if you have layoffs and you're not having the contributions going in to the 401ks as well. And then you that's, have the that's exactly my point. Mm -hmm. We've had distributions on the part of baby boomers for years, but they've been more than offset by new entrants to the workforce. People can, you know, constantly every it's it's automated. Every time you get a paycheck, you contribute to a four hundred one k. We're seeing or the beginning of a reversal in that trend because they've laid off so many white collar workers, and and there's no yeah, but look. UPS just laid off. 12,000 white collar workers. They told everybody else if they want to keep their jobs, they're going to be in the office five days a week. There's a switch up for you. But a lot of companies are using remote work as an initial criteria to uh, on the pathway to layoffs. But that's 12,000 people. I looked inside of, of UPS's website and they were contributing, I think, 8%. Um, so it's not just... The, the matching, yeah. Agree. It's the match. Mm. That's such an interesting thing to think about. Yeah. It drives the market, though. It's the reason we put the Magnificent in the Magnificent 7, which is now 6, because Tesla's losing money. It's, it, but it's the reason. It's, 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 the, it's the construct of an index fund is the largest market cap weight companies are the ones that rise the most because you, by definition, have to put the most in them because they're the highest market capitalization, but that makes them grow more. And you're talking about a quadrillion market cap company and all kinds of fun things like that. Who's going to be the first trillionaire? We. 
Mm, yeah. Let me ask you this too, because um, we had the Federal Reserve's FLMC meeting this month. Um, looks like rate cuts aren't happening in March. Uh, I know a lot of people were expecting rate cuts in March. And um, I've had conversations on the show, like um, it was uh, Jeff Sherman from Double Line, whom I know you, you know, and he was saying not until like June at the earliest or something. Can we get your take on the Federal Reserve and maybe your outlook for rates? So um, again, Powell is purposely hiding behind data that he knows is going to be revised, right? He's a lawyer, not a PhD in economics. He doesn't actually believe uh, the data that's being released and he knows it's going to be revised. That doesn't make a difference. He still wants to be the guy who pushed through the mother of all regulatory regime shifts that cuts the oxygen off to the non-banking sector with Basel III endgame. He's got to stick around until May of 2026 to get that job done when his term ends. And therefore, if he wants to stick around, he's got to have a purpose and a mission. And that purpose and mission appears to be waiting as long as he can for the first rate cut and pushing off until the, at least the second half of the year. They're going to talk about tapering quantitative tightening in March. He said that at the podium. Uh, but I think if you listen to all the Fed officials, it sounds like they want to wait until the second half of 2024 to actually start to reduce the amount by which they're running off their balance sheet. He's just buying time. So to Mr. Sherman's point, you know, if he can hold off until June, that is mission accomplished for Jay Powell. And everybody said, no, no, it's going to be March. But watch them walk it back. He got confirmed in May of 2022. And ever since then, markets come to their conclusions. And Jay Powell just gently, these are not the droids you're looking for, gently, gently, gently changes the narrative until market participants get the point. And that's, we're going to do things when I said we're going to do things and not until then. So if he can wait till June, he will. Hey there, I hope that you are enjoying this interview. If you can, please take a moment to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and ring the notification bell. This will keep you up to date with all of our new interviews, and it will also help us grow this channel and continue to bring some amazing guests. Thank you so much for your support and enjoy the rest of the interview. I also asked um, this question, if you were in that room, like at an FOMC presser, and you could put one question to Fed Chair Powell, what would you ask? You know, I, uh, Julia, I would ask him about the regulations. I would ask him um, the hardest question, and that is, you know, in 2018, 2019, the not QE era, Jamie Dimon showed you who was boss. Um, and it wasn't you, by the way. So do you really believe that your legacy can be changing regulation such that three quarters of Jamie Dimon's business model and that of the largest hedge funds in the world that live and breathe off of levering up treasuries with no skin in the game, do you really believe you can press forward with such tremendous change to the financial system such that that be your legacy. So I'd ask him, you know, a softball question. <laughs> of course not. Um, another thing that's so interesting to me, just I wanna, um, you know, revisit maybe a bit of your career. You, you spent um, many years at the Dallas Fed. I know you were a close advisor to um, then Dallas Fed President uh, Richard Fisher. And you're someone who, you look at data, you look at different data. Um, and. And I find that so fascinating. Besides what we mentioned at the top of the conversation, is there any other data point that's been on your radar lately that's really interesting that's not getting enough airtime? Um, in a word, backlogs. I um, People like to follow what they call leading indicators. So if you had to boil it all the way down to one, I like to follow the indicator that leads leading indicators. And that would be backlogs. Because if you have backlogs, then you have demand that you have not been able to meet that is pent up and the need to continue looking for new employees 
in order to fill that pent up demand. Now, when your backlogs turn negative, as they have been for more than a year now, looking at manufacturing surveys and now looking at the services surveys, that means that pent up demand has gone the other direction and it's negative. And that tells you what's going to lead the leading indicators. It tells you where the economy is going. And that's, you know, to borrow from Wayne Gretzky, you know, you want to know where the puck is going to go. And that's what backlogs tell you. So recession? I think they're going to backdate it to October 2023. So we're already in one or we had one? Well, I don't think we're out of it. It's just, um, unless it's different this time, uh, in data back to 1976 from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, every time we've had 50 or more states, and how do we have more? Because Washington, D.C. is counted as one. But every time we have 50 or more states with state-level unemployment rates rising, back to 1976, nine out of nine times, so an even more um, accurate predictor than the yield curve, we've been in recession. That occurred in October of 2023, unless it's different this time. Um, one final question for you, and um, this is more of like a more of like re revisiting the background. I mentioned being at the Fed, but um, you are a prolific writer and, and you put out incredible research and you, you have a journalism background too. And I heard a story and I, I don't know the story, but I want you to share it, um, how you got into writing. And I think even Warren Buffett called out your writing at some point. Was that is that a true story that he saw your writing or something like that? So here's the dirt. Um, when I was on Wall Street all those years, I, I, I just thought that if there was an eighth night of the week, I would go out on that night too. So um, I put myself in the corner. I went back to graduate school. It had always been my dream to get a journalism degree from Columbia. I, I was 16 when I went to go visit Columbia's journalism school for the first time. Um, so I went, I put myself in the corner, did some time out, went back to school. I was a night student. Uh, ended up calling the publisher of the Dallas Morning News. When I was leaving Wall Street, I had signed a non-compete. I had agreed to leave leave the industry for a while, so I didn't really have anything to do moving to Dallas, Texas. So I, I called the publisher of the Dallas Morning News, who spoken to one of my classes, one of my night, night classes at Columbia. I asked him if he needed um, a, an old free internist, and he said, yes, free works for me. And um, several months into my position, um, Warren Buffett reached out to me and said, this is pretty interesting. You're worried about the United States selling treasury bonds to China. I, I think you should come to Omaha and we should talk about it. Um, so I did. Wow. So you got you went to Omaha and you talked to Warren about it? I did. I talked to Charlie Munger more, oh, which wow. is a lot more fun. Oh, Munger. I'm a, I'm a, I've, I've um, always been more of a Munger groupie. I have like I have my yeah. signed um, I almanac, from the poor Charlie's almanac. Yeah. I have one too. He sent me one after, yeah. after, after Omaha. So that was like my super, super, super high point. Uh, Warren was so as cool. energetic and hyperactive as I was. Charlie was kind of chill. Is it? And I was one of 15 American journalists who were there in Omaha 1-5. So I was like, wow. Well. Uh, but I just I just hung out with Charlie. Yeah. Wow. What He was so incredible. What a cool story. I had no idea. I, I thought I heard that, but that's awesome. I love that, Daniel. It's so cool. Um, well, all right. You know, we, we published eight times people are like you're the most prolific writer on planet earth we publish eight times a week and people are entertained and educated at the same time and that's what i want to do i mean i love to mix my backgrounds because if you can make somebody laugh in the morning when you're talking about backlogs you know then they're going to read and and it's going to hook them in and they're going to learn and that's all i want to do financial literacies it is my absolute mission in life it's why i wrote fed up um it's why I do what I do every day. And I, I get to my two passions, you know, economics, finance, monetary policy, the markets, and writing. Yeah. Well, let folks know where they can find your writing and also any parting thoughts before I let you go. Um, yes, it's, it's an election year. That, that's, that's my parting thought. We spent, we're spending like we're fighting World War III on three fronts. 
That's how I characterize how much the U.S. government is spending. So we have to be cognizant of the um, of where we are in history right now. We have to be cognizant of the importance of this election in this election year. Um, so uh, vote. <laughs> As my my middle just turned eighteen, vote uh, and and come follow me on Twitter at Demartino Booth. And and if you want to jump in and get a sample of what I write, come find me at demartinobooth.substack.com. Well, Daniel Demartino Booth, CEO and Chief Strategist of QI Research. Thank you so much for your time. Always a pleasure to have you on, Daniel. Really appreciate you. Great to be here. Thank you, Julia.